I need, as we begin here, give you a little bit of background. I know that not all of you were with us last Sunday, but last Sunday we spent our time in verse 10 where it says, So then every one of us, we must all excuse, we must all, excuse me, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, whether they be good or bad. The reality is, the Bible teaches us, that every single man upon this earth, every single woman and every single child, every single person that has lived, will someday stand before the judgment of God. At that judgment, the piercing, fiery eyes of Jesus will see in the deepest recesses of our dark hearts and will expose there the sins that glorify His name. The majority of people in the world, the Bible tells us, will stand before what is called the great white throne judgment at the end of the times of this world. And that great white throne judgment, every person will be an unbeliever. Every person there will be an unbeliever. And every person, as they are shown the depths of the wickedness in their heart, will be a vindication of the glory of God in condemning them, as the Bible says in Revelation 19, to the lake of fire forever. It's a serious judgment. Many of us have accepted Jesus Christ as our personal saviors. As our personal savior, excuse me, he's the only savior. But each of us have received Him to ourselves as Savior. And as such, we will not face that judgment. There will never be a question hanging over our account whether we will spend eternity in heaven or in the lake of fire. That is settled in the fact that Jesus bore our sins before the Father upon that cross. However, the Bible tells us there will be an accounting for every one of us for our own Christian lives. It's a different judgment. It's called the Bema Seat. That's what it's referred to here as... So then, or for everyone must appear before the Bema seat of Christ. After we die, there will be a reckoning. There will be a time when you and I will stand individually before Christ and we will be judged upon the basis of our life as a Christian. I hope for you that you will hear Jesus say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I hope that with all my heart. But the one thing that we are assured of from the passage that we read in Scripture is that not every Christian will hear the commendation of Christ at the Bema seat. In fact, it says here that we will receive the things done in the body, whether they be good or bad. Now, the reality of that truth, which, by the way, is so often glossed over in Christian churches today, so seldom preached that many Christians don't even know about it, and I think is the core reason why there is such a shallow obedience of Christ among Christians today, that truth changes the way we think. It changes it in two ways. This morning, we're going to look at the first way. Next Sunday, we're going to look at the second way, and I really plead with you, if at all possible, to come back next week to look at the second one. I'll just show, them to, show the two of them to you here in this passage. We begin a new pa paragraph in verse, uh, verse 11. First of all, the, the reality of the Bema Seat of Christ convinces us to live righteously because of the terror of the Lord. In other words, and by the way, the Greek word is the same, the fear of God. The second reason is given to us in verse 14, where it says, for the love of Christ constrains us. So you see, knowing about the Bema Seat, knowing the reality of this biblical judgment that every one of us will someday face, we are motivated by both the terror of the Lord and the love of Christ. Now, since I'm dividing it into two sermons, it is necessary that this morning's sermon, which will be upon the terror of the Lord or the fear of God, is going to be a hard sermon. Next week, we're going to talk about the love of Christ. And maybe we would all enjoy that sermon a little bit better. We like to think positively. We like to think about the love of Christ. But today we're going to focus our thoughts upon the terror of the Lord. I would be remiss before you as a pastor. I would not be faithful to my responsibilities to the Lord Jesus Christ who has called me into ministry if I did not take the time to carefully and thoroughly deal with this issue that is so clearly before us in Scripture Day. I would fail you, and I would, I would be uh, held responsible if someday you stood before this Christ and faced this truth without ever having heard from the Word of God. So let me today be serious before you as my, in my relationship with God and share with you what these verses are saying to us today. The first thing we have to see is that this, these verses are talking about a very real fear of God. Should believers live in the fear of God? Absolutely they should. 
And I don't mean in the kind of watered down sense in which so many people talk about the fear of God today. You know, you talk to your average person on the street and they'll tell you that they fear God. But they don't really understand what that word means. And I don't really know why they don't understand it because the word's pretty straightforward. Fear is fear. Now, it's not an uncontrolled fear. It's not a fear that drives us to delirium. It's a fear where we understand, as with fire, that if we do not deal with it according to the rules that God has given, we will suffer destruction. There are rules given to us about our walk with Christ. And let me be clear once more, this is not so we can get to heaven and avoid the lake of fire. It's because we have been saved and we bear the name of Christ as believers. We must understand the fear of God. First of all, I want you to see in our text here this morning what we know. It says there, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Let me say this as we begin. We have not always known the fear of God. We have not always known the terror of the Lord. The word that's used here for knowing is not the basic Greek word for knowing, uh, gnosko. It's a different word, uh, uh, oida, which has to do with the idea that there was a moment that we began to become aware of this truth. This is not an intrinsic knowledge. This is not a knowledge that we have from our birth. It's not a knowledge that we gather from our culture or our human existence. It's a knowledge that we began to be aware of as we were reading the Word of God. God brought these thoughts to our mind. So we began to know it. And Paul writes here as one who has come to understand it thoroughly. He says, because we know, because we have learned this, we are speaking to you from a point of knowledge here about the fear of God. We talked a little bit about it last week. Maybe for some of you, it was the first time you heard about the fact that you're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Maybe that was the first time in your mind there entered that reality that there's going to be a, an accounting made for what you have done with your life. You began to know it. Some of us have been dealing with this for several years. Since it became kind of a flashpoint among our bodies several years ago when we were talking about this, this truth of the judgment of the believers. And we've been thinking about it and studying Scripture about it and learning about it. But we are knowing more and more the real and genuine fear of God. Now, when I'm talking about the fear of God, I'm talking about a very real understanding that he has the power and nay, not just the power, but the right and responsibility to destroy that which is not pleasing to him. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians to begin the thoughts about this fear of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and uh, where Paul first mentions this judgment in his writings to the people of Corinth. And he says this in verse 11, 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 11, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. May I stop there long enough to say this? If you're a believer, the foundation of your salvation is not on your works, it's on what Jesus has done. Your faith is in Christ and not in yourself. That is your foundation. But upon your foundation of salvation in Christ Jesus, you are building a life. And reading on here, it says, Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. And if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. John the Baptist said when he was baptizing in Jordan, he says, I indeed baptize with water, but the one that comes after me, whose shoes I'm not worthy to unlatch, he shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. There will be a fiery judgment of our lives someday before Jesus Christ. And if we have been building our lives with the things that matter for eternity, the gold, the silver, and the precious stones, as the fire is applied to become more purified, Sitting in the front of my father-in-law's house, there is a lump of metal. It's a lump of aluminum that we picked up from Charlotte Fire, one of the houses that was destroyed. It is what used to be an engine head. It melted during the fire, pulled down on the ground among the gravel, and now it's just a lump of aluminum that's been purified by fire. And so it is with those of us who build with gold, silver, and precious stones. There's purity that comes from the fires. The dross is burned away. 
But those of us as believers who have gone on to live after our salvation with lives that are built around our own selfish desires and wants and needs and so-called directions, who have lived for the things of this earth, for money and for power and for friends and for fame, those who have lived for the things of this earth and of this self and not for God, someday they will stand before God and everything they have invested their lives into will become smoke and ash to be washed away before the searching eyes of Jesus. He shall suffer loss. Read on with me in verse 15. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. I remind you, the foundation stands firm. The foundation will not burn. The foundation is Jesus. Your salvation is not lost. And if you're here today and your tendency is to have doubts about whether you will be saved by trusting Jesus, will you hold on to that phrase? Will you grab it and say, I believe that even if I live a, a sinful life as a believer, that even if I live, I shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Hold on to that verse. But if you're like so many Christians today who say now that you're saved, you can live however you want to, then I want you to hear the other verses. The rest of that verse, I should say, you shall suffer loss when the fire is applied. This is the thing that's spoken of in the book of Hebrews. I want you to turn there and look at some things here. And I want you to imagine yourself in the very real future when you are standing before your Savior, before your Christ, before your God, when He in all of His beauty and His holiness stands before you and you know in that moment that it was the sacrifice of His entire life that gave you eternity. And you look into His eyes. In that moment of your judgment, I want you to think about these verses we will read here in Hebrews. Start with me in chapter 6. Chapter 6 says in verse 4, Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 4, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted of the good God, Word of God and the powers of the world to come. It's a definition, it's a description of a person who has become a believer in Jesus Christ. They actually have the Holy Ghost dwelling inside them. It says they are actually understanding the Word of God. They actually have some comprehension of the powers of the world to come. But it says it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, skip down to verse 6, if they shall fall away to renew them again to repentance, seeing they crucified themselves the Son of God afresh and put Him to an open shame. Now, there are a lot of people who take these verses to mean that if you are a believer and then you start to backslide, you lose your salvation, you can't get saved again. That's not what that's saying. What it's saying is repentance is something that you do once and for all. You can't go back and do it again. And when you as a believer begin to live an ungodly life, you fall away and your testimony before others is the testimony of someone who is not living for Christ. You are literally taking what you know has occurred, this crucifixion of the Son of Christ, and you are crucifying Him again, as it were. You cannot go back to the beginning. And what happens there in that loss of your testimony as you backslide is something that cannot be covered. Everybody sees it. Everybody sees it. And by the way, someday... It will be made manifest in this judgment. Now let me say here for a moment, we as believers sin, all of us do. The Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9 that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. The only way that if we have sinned against God that that will not be brought up at the, at the Bema seat is if we confess it to Him and He forgives it. But reading on here, listen to this person, this believer who has backslidden. It says this about them in verse 7. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. I like to garden. I love to see things grow. I love to watch the irrigation fall upon the ground, and the ground drink up that irrigation, and then the minerals in the ground begin to produce a plant in which we can harvest vegetables that are good to eat. That is a blessing from God, and it is blessed by God. But listen to this, verse 8. Verse 7 will be a picture of a believer who is living in the power of the Holy Spirit and according to the Word of God. But verse 8 says this, But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected. It's a Greek word here that means unapproved. Adakimos is the Greek word. It's the same word, listen to me carefully, that Paul used in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 27 when he said this, 
But I keep under my body, lest that by any means, after I have preached to others, I myself should become a castaway. Now, Paul was not afraid of losing his salvation. Paul was not afraid that he wasn't really saved. What Paul was afraid of is that after he had lived a life of faithful service to God, that at any moment he could stop doing that and start living selfishly, and in that moment he would slip into this category of the unapproved, or the rejected. At the Bama seat of Christ, his life would not be a sterling example of faithful service, but it would be marred by this selfish self-destruction. And that's the same word that's used here when it says this, but that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, cast away, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. Don't jump and meet at Lake of Fire, by the way. This is not talking about being cast in Lake of Fire. It's talking about the believer at the Bama seat whose works are tried by fire, as we saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Or 1 Corinthians chapter 3, excuse me. It shall be revealed by fire. Everything you're doing in this life is someday going to come in the fire of God's judgment. And He will see, and you will see, more importantly, what is really worthwhile and what is not. If that puts some little fear in your heart, you're getting the idea of the terror of the Lord. Skip a little farther forward to Hebrews chapter 10. This is the same subject. Hebrews chapter 10, <clears throat> same subject. And by the way, again, still talking to believers, I'll prove that to you just briefly before we read the passage. In verse 19 it says this, "...having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way which He hath consecrated for us through the veil that is to say His flesh." Can I say that He's talking to believers there? I believe so. They are brethren who have come into the presence of God through Jesus. That's how we're saved. These are Christian people. Like so many of you are. He even gives a command to attending church. In verse 24, it says, uh, uh, verse 25, excuse me, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Now, who is he speaking to? He's speaking to believers. He's saying, encourage one another in the fellowshipping together, the assembling together. Get down there and, and serve the brethren as you go to church. He's talking to believers. Listen to the next verse. For... Still speaking to believers, my friends. If we sin willfully after that, we have received the knowledge of the truth. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Again, people have used this to suggest you lose your salvation. Maybe if you don't attend church. That is not biblical truth. Put that far from your mind. Your salvation depends in Christ. But if you as a believer will live your life for yourself and not for the service of Christ and the brethren, the Bible speaks of the serious nature of the judgment here of God. There is a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery in a nation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who had trodden underfoot the Son of God hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite the Spirit of grace. For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Many people have used that verse to preach to unbelievers about the fearfulness of hell someday, that they will face a literal burning fiery hell someday if they do not trust Christ as their Savior. And by the way, that's a biblical truth. But do you see that this is not written to the unbeliever? This is written to believers who need to be shaken out of their selfish stupor into a service of God, saying to them that someday they will stand before God, that the fear of God ought to literally strike to the depths of their heart. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And again, I turn you to Hebrews chapter 12. Same audience, similar subject. Hebrews chapter 12, and I'm going to read verses 25 through 26, or 29, excuse me. 
See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on the earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Oh, I know so many believers whose Bibles lie covered with dust on the shelves in their homes. I know so many believers who have never taken the opportunity to read the precious Word of God through and through. I know so many believers who couldn't quote to you more than five or six Bible verses. I know so many believers who will not be faithful in the attendance of the preaching of the Word of God in church. What if we refuse Him who speaks from heaven so freely? What says it here? Whose voice then shook the earth, but now He hath promised, saying, Yet once more will I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things which are shaken, and of, those things, and of things that are made, and that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. I'm just trying to show you the truth of God's word. I'm not here to glory in anybody's destruction. I'm not here because I take pleasure in harsh doctrines. But I will not be unfaithful to you by stepping around this issue so that I can coddle baby Christians and tickle your ears and make you feel good when you walk away from here. The reality of the word of God is that every single one of you will face the fiery judgment of God someday. So will I. Again, listen carefully. If we are believers, we will never be in the lake of fire for eternity. But if we are believers, we will someday stand before the Bama seat of Christ. If you haven't heard that taught in many churches, it's because our churches have become weak. Our Christianity has become soft. It's in the Bible. And we see it right here in our text this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. I can give you just a brief little interview, uh, overview, excuse me. I, there's so many passages we could go to about this Bama seat. I could, but I'm going to give you just a, a brief little overview of what it is. Each one of us will someday stand individually for Christ. Our, our works as believers will be judged. Jesus himself said that. We'll be judged according to our works. And based on those works, we'll receive in kind. As we have treated God, He will treat us. If we have lived without God essentially on this earth, then He will deny us up in heaven. If we, if we, we, will, we will also receive as we have treated other people. If we have been unmerciful to people, God will be unmerciful to us in that judgment. The Bible says that some will receive a reward. We've already talked about, well done, thou good and faithful servant. What a blessing would it be to hear Jesus say that. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. In one of His parables, Jesus suggests that when a person hears that, they will receive to rule with him over cities in his kingdom when he rules upon this earth. He said in Luke chapter 18, if you've been faithful in that which is little, I'll make you also faithful in that which is much. He gave to the man who had ten talents, he gave to him the rule over ten cities. The implication is that when Christ rules on this earth, those who have lived faithfully for him will have the opportunity to rule with him in great positions of power on this earth, great positions of authority. On the other hand, the one who only had one talent, Jesus said, take away from him that which he hath and give it to him that hath ten. Those who have lived selfishly have done nothing with what God has given to them in salvation. The implication is we'll have nothing to do in the kingdom. And by the way, that's a more serious loss than you anticipate. The reason we don't want to serve Christ today, the reason we're reluctant to serve him today is because we don't see him as he is. Our view is veiled. We see the world as being so much more attractive. We see a well-funded 401k being, or 401k being what's attractive. We see a, a prominent job as being what's attractive. But boy, listen, when you come face to face with Jesus, when you see him for the first time, you see those nail-scarred hands and you see his face, you see the eyes, you see the, the form of the Lord Jesus, the one who crucified, was crucified for you in that moment, my friends, everything else will fade. And with eyes that are purified where the flesh is gone, you're going to want more than anything else to express your love to him through your service. One preacher said it this way, suppose that in the kingdom every day the Lord came and gave out assignments, and each day the Lord came day after day and said, you can do this for me, and you can do that for me, and you go serve me here. 
and every day to imagine yourself being overlooked and left with nothing to do. And every day thinking, is there nothing for me to do? But essentially the idea of the Bama State Judgment, the loss of that is, is that if you didn't serve me here on this earth, you're not going to have the privilege of serving me there in the kingdom, which will be upon the earth as well. You will not have that privilege. And again, you say, well, that's no big loss to me. That's because you don't understand how much you're going to love Jesus then. Does that make sense? It's severe. It will be severe. It will be the fear of God. And literally, when you see that everything you live for is, is left before you, destroyed into ash and smoke, and you have nothing to present to the one who saved you, in thankfulness for that salvation, my friends, I say to you in that day, there will be weeping. There will be shame. There will be gnashing of teeth. And the Word of God is here to warn us of the fear of God. He is just. He is holy. And we will give an account. This is what we know. First Corinthians chapter 11. I said, first of all, I want you to see what we know. I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians. I think I said first, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 5. Knowing therefore the fear, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Secondly, I want you to see what we do. Because we know the fear of the Lord, what do we do? We persuade men. Because we know that there's going to come a day when we will stand before Christ. Yes, when every man will stand before Christ. We are busy about the work of persuading men. Let me, let me, this might seem like a little bit of a sidestep from the point here, just for a moment. But I want you to notice the method by which we do the work of God. We persuade men. We don't compel men to be saved. We don't go out and put a gun to their head and say, you need to trust Jesus as your Savior. Do it now or I'll shoot you. We don't say, if you don't trust Jesus as your Savior, we're going to fire you from your job. We don't say that if you don't become a Christian, you're not going to be our friend. We're not trying to manipulate people into salvation or compel them to be saved. It is one of our strong convictions that if you force a person to a conversion, then they're not really converted. We can force people to conform on the outside, but we cannot change a person's heart. On the outside, they might say, okay, I'm a Christian, I believe Jesus is the Christ, but unless their heart believes it, they will not be saved. A person cannot be forced to believe or disbelieve. There's a freedom of conscience. And so our job is not to try to get the government to enforce Christianity on everybody. Our job is not to become... You know, a Christian nation where you can't live here as a citizen unless you profess Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's not our work. That's not how we go about the work. Instead, the work that God does is by us trying to convince men, trying to persuade men, and letting God change their hearts. Why do we believe that? Because we believe that when those people stand before Christ someday, when we stand before Christ someday, He's not going to look at the outward conformity that someone has pressed upon the person from the outside. He's going to look into the very depths of their heart and He's going to see what's really there. I could make a million converts to Christianity and make them believe or act, let, make them act the way that I want to act, but then they might someday stand before Christ and Christ look into every heart and see that every heart was an unbelieving heart. And my friends, we will have made no difference for eternity. In fact, maybe we have done damage to eternity by convincing people they're saved by what we forced them to be on the outside. You understand what I'm saying? The heart has to change. And we cannot change hearts. There is no, there's, there is no torture device. There is no manipulation that can change a person's heart. The only thing that changes a person's heart is when they become convinced of truth. And so our job, the method by which we do the work, is just by simply trying to convince people that these words are true, that Jesus is the Christ. By trying to persuade them, by speaking to them, by challenging their minds. By the way, notice also in this that every person has to be persuaded. Did you know that? You know what that means? That means every person's thinking is wrong. There's a place where Paul is talking about his conversion experience and he talked about what Christ told him to do after he was converted and he said he was supposed to go and preach the gospel to Gentiles. Um, 
to preach the doctrine. I can't remember the exact word just slipped out of my mind. They were there just two minutes ago, I promise you. <laughs> but something about the, to the effect that all men must repent. Do you understand what that means? That means there's not a single person upon the earth whose thinking is right to begin with. They all have to repent. Yours isn't, mine isn't, mine wasn't. Repentance is taking what we had thought and changing into what God thinks. And how do we do that? We do that by learning the Word of God. We do that by a decision to say God's Word is truth and not me. And people have to change. If there is no change of thinking, there is no salvation. There must be repentance. You know, there was a day when I realized I was a sinner. There was a day when I realized I, there was no way I was going to save myself. You know, I may be strong enough to get around this world and make myself okay in this world. I may be able to earn an income and pay for my bills and provide for my family. And I can walk and talk just like any other person, but I can't walk and talk my way into heaven. That had to change. My thinking had to change. I had to understand that I can't save myself, but God provided a Savior. And instead of trusting myself, I began to trust in what Jesus did. You see, repentance is a change of our thinking. And everybody's thinking must change. And so our business is to go about and begin to try to persuade men, this is the Christ, this is the Savior. You cannot save yourself. Your church can't save you. Your works can't save you. There's nothing you do to get to heaven, but Christ can save. He is God's Messiah. We persuade men. Why do we do it? Because we know that every man, every man, woman, and child that we see every day will someday stand before the piercing eyes of Christ. Your family members will stand before Christ. Your friends will stand before Christ. Your co-workers will stand before Christ. The people you pass at Walmart in the aisle, they will stand before Christ. The people you drive next to in the street, they will stand before Christ. Our business is to persuade men. And we need to get serious about this reality. The fiery judgment awaits God's people. The, uh, excuse me, the fiery judgment awaits people whom God has created. And we must speak to people about that judgment so they be persuaded. We persuade men because the reality of these judgments, there's no time, my friends, to waste. There's no time to sit around and occupy ourselves with other things. There's no energy for anything else. We must devote ourselves to this job and this job only, where everything else is secondary to persuading men of eternal realities. We persuade men. That's what we do. And then thirdly, I want you to see this. this. There's what we are in this verse. What we know, the terror of the Lord, what we do, we persuade men. Secondly, what we are, or thirdly, what we are. We are made manifest unto God. Oh, my friends. The knowledge of the judgment seat of Christ and the fear of God, when it overwhelms our minds and our thinking, as I hope it does yours, will change the way we look at ourselves. You see, the gravest consideration of the believer's heart is this. God sees me through and through. There is no hidden place in my heart from God. There is no dark corner God does not see. There is no hidden place where He has not been. He knows and sees it all. My friends, we are manifest in the eyes of God. He sees us every, every whit, every bit of us He sees. I read this verse last week, but let me read again. Maybe you're still in Hebrews. <clears throat> it's Hebrews chapter 4. Uh, you don't have to turn if you don't want to, but if you can get there or you're close by there, then look at it with me. I'll read it carefully and slowly for those of you that might not be in that passage with us. Hebrews chapter 4, listen to me. It says, The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, the word says. The Bible says, Piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and, is, and the joints and the marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. God not only sees what we do on the outside, He sees what we think on the inside. In Psalms 139, it says, Thou knowest my thought afar off. The idea is that God knows our thoughts before we even think them. He sees our thoughts. Not only does He see our thoughts, but He sees the motivation for our thoughts. Sometimes we don't even know why we do what we do. We don't even know why we think the way we think. But it says here that God, God's Word uh, discerns the thoughts and the intents of the heart. God knows you better than you know yourself. Jeremiah 17, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? 
Not a one of us knows what's really going on in our hearts. The very next verse says, I, the Lord, know the heart and search the... I, the Lord, know the heart and try the reins. God knows it. He sees every single detail of who you are down deep inside. Listen to this next verse in Hebrews 4, verse 12. I read verse 13 follows. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Someday, my friends, the great reality is, is that I will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and this is the sister reality. He sees everything. I can't hide it by doing it in the middle of the night. I can't hide it by doing it in a closet with the light off. I can't hide it by keeping it locked up in my thoughts. God sees it. And it will be brought, it will be brought into judgment. Someday it will be revealed. We are manifest. We are transparent in the eyes of God. He sees right through us. But not only are we manifest in the God, look at this next phrase. Paul says, I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Follow with me carefully here. When I understand that the greatest reality is that someday I will stand before Christ and that Christ knows me thoroughly, not only am I understanding my transparency for God, but I'm beginning to live my transparency before men. Do you follow me? We all are professional hypocrites. We all are. What I mean by that is we have learned how to put on a face for other people. We all have. We all do this. We don't want them to see the bad side. And we all have bad sides. We don't want them to know where we struggle. We don't want them to know the temptations that we deal with. We don't want them to know the sins that we commit. And so we put on a good face. You know? We put on a smile. Put on some nice clothes, comb our hair, put on the makeup, whatever we do. But that's just symptomatic of the reality that we're always projecting this image of ourselves before other people because we want other people not to know what really happens inside. It's a little harder with our spouses because they're around us a lot. But I would suggest to you, even to our spouses, we are not always transparent. That's our nature. But when we understand that God sees it all anyway, and He's the only one I really have to worry about, He's the only one I'll answer to, it becomes more easy for us to be transparent with other people. We need this kind of transparency. Do you know that? We need this kind of transparency. We do not need people walking around acting like they're more spiritual than they really are. You know why? Because there are struggling brothers or sisters are looking up to them and they're thinking, I could never be like that. They see you with your facade of Christian perfection and they look at themselves and they see their failings and they say, I don't know what's wrong with me. The truth of the Word of God is what's wrong with you is, what's, is the same thing that's wrong with me. That's the reality of it. I'm not suggesting we go all, all go around and tell everybody the dirty details of all the sins we've committed this week. There's no point in that. But let us not be afraid either to also say, I'm a sinner like you. I have struggled with temptation this morning like you. We need that kind of transparency that recognizes it's not about me. It's about the Holy Spirit that's in me that in my flesh there is nothing good, that without Christ I would be nothing good. And it is that same Jesus Christ, that same Holy Spirit that is working in you. We need transparency. We need transparency in our homes, moms and dads. We need transparency in our, in our marriages, husband and wife. We need transparency in our classes, teachers. We need transparency in our government. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? We need transparency in our churches. We need transparency in the pulpit. Instead of intimidating each other with the projection of righteousness, we need to be willing to say to one another, listen, I'm struggling too. I have flesh like you. 
And we are together pursuing Jesus imperfectly in this flesh. But together we're trying to live out the glory of God in our lives. I love Paul here. He says, I trust also remain manifest in your conscience. Have you ever read some of the words that Paul says? We think of Paul as great sterling Christian. Spotless, wasn't he? Man, he was a great man of God. Did you read where he said that he was the chief of sinners? Did you read where he said, I'm not worthy to be called an apostle? Did you read where he said in Romans chapter 7, how to find that which is good? How to do that which is good? I find not. Have you read where he said, I know that in me, as in my flesh, there dwelleth no good thing? I wonder if we were to meet the Apostle Paul, not the image we have of him, but the real Paul, if we wouldn't find a man who was humbly willing to say, I am a sinner and I fall and I sin against God, but oh, my heart is for living for the Lord. And if you're a believer, you have in some measure that same testimony. Yes, you sin. Yes, you fall. Yes, there are mistakes you make. Yes, there are things that will be judged. But if you're a believer, there is some spark of desire to the God, the God you love be glorified. We need to fan that flame, don't we? We need to fan that flame. We don't need to put it out with the cold breath of hypocrisy. We need to fan it into life with the sympathy of other burning coals. Transparency. Paul says in verse 12, For we commend not ourselves again unto you. He uses that word before this in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 where he said this, do we begin again to commend ourselves or need we as some others epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? Ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. Paul said, we don't need to have letters of recommendation to you or from you. All we need is to show that you are the working of God. God has worked through us to work in your heart. That's all we need. He used the word also in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 in verse 2 where he said this, But we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation the truth commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. You know what happens when I can confess before you that I'm a sinner who struggles with sin on a daily basis? You know what happens? Then I can put myself out of the picture. And I can say, it is not me that will change you. It's not my example that you should follow. And then we can lift up something else that is more worthy, and that is the truth of God that's right here in Scripture. And I can stand with you as one of the sinners that have been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, one of those whose love of Christ is struggling to walk righteously, and I can with you point to the Word of God and say, there's our beacon. That we will follow. There's the truth. Instead of standing here and saying, I speak for God, I say to you, this is the Word of God. Follow and hear it. That's what happens with transparency. Truth is elevated. We commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you an occasion and glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. I remind you again, there are a lot of people who they glory in what appears on the outside, what the face is. Oh, look at that great Christian. I'll bet he prays four hours every day. You know what? That's one of the things I struggle with as a pastor, my own prayer life. Don't you think, don't think for a moment that because I'm a pastor, I've got it together as far as my prayer life goes, or anything for that matter. I struggle. There are days that pass and I haven't prayed to God. Sometimes I sit and I wonder why God keeps me in the ministry. But that's the reality. I struggle with it. I know you struggle with it. We both, I, the reason I know that is not because I'm judging any of you, but because I know you're like me. We struggle with these things. And a lot of people take this, the appearance, and they say, well, that's tremendous, but what really matters is not the inside, but the, or not the outside. Well, I said that backward. Not the outside, but the inside, what God sees. Can we be sincere with each other? Can we be transparent with others? Can we be truthful with each other? Can God's word be glorified among us? It can when we remember that the greatest truth is that someday we're going to stand for God. That's the main thing we need to work for. And since he's the one that searches the heart, I want to have a heart that's pure, sincere, and transparent.
I want to have truth reigning inside. You follow me? I'm afraid a lot of those people who are edifices of Christianity are really nothing but piling up sins of hypocrisy for which they will be judged. So verse 13 then finishes with this. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God. Or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. So two concepts here in this verse. The first one is being beside yourself. You know what that means? Uh, literally the Greek word exists to me. It's from where we get the word existential. It has to do with the idea of being outside of your own self. Being beyond yourself, being outside of yourselves. It, it, it's, it's, it's really the word that they used in the old in this culture back then to describe someone who was crazy. <laughs> and so if I said someone was existomy, it means they were crazy. They were insane. They're insane. Paul's saying, whether we be insane, it is to God. Or whether we be sober, and there's the word, by the way, they would use for the exact opposite concept, being sane, making sense, being rational and reasonable. Whether it be sober, it is for your cause. When we begin to live transparently, just living out the glory of God because we know God sees and we're just living it all entirely for His purposes, there are some things we do the world will say is crazy. Do you know that? There are some things the world will say. They'll, they'll shake their head and say, those crazy Christians, that crazy Christian, what is he thinking? We have a dear friend. I shared with her on, uh, shared about her for those of you who were here on Wednesday night that she had breast cancer. Just found out about it last week. She went in the doctor on Friday, just yes, uh, this last Friday, and uh, they were going to do some. They had done some more tests. They were looking at it, and they found out that that cancer metastasized into every organ of her body. They told her on Friday, "There's nothing they can do for her." When she called my wife last night, I took the call before I took it to her. I didn't know all this, but I knew she had the cancer. And she says, I'm so happy. I have more joy than I've ever had in my life for what God is doing with me. You know what the world says about that? That's crazy. How can you be happy when you know you're beyond medical help? If we be crazy, it's to God. And, and Mrs. Harris is ready to meet her Lord. Now, she's not old. She's in good health besides the cancer. You know, our hearts go out to her and her husband both. But she knows that this is what God has prepared her for. This is the opportunity for her to bring glory to God's name. She's already had opportunities to witness, to doctors. When they first gave her the, the, the news, she said, Something effective, thank God. That's crazy. That's nuts. The world will never understand it. But when we are happy in the middle of tremendous tribulations, it's only because we understand it is to God that we will give an account. You hear me? That's crazy. How else are we crazy? Sometimes as believers we get crazy in our zeal. We want people to know about Christ and we go out and try to share Christ with people. Maybe we go out and pass out tracts on the street corner. Maybe we hold an event and invite folks to come. We get zealous about sharing the truth of Christ with people. And there are a lot of unbelievers that will look at that and say, it's nuts, those crazy Jesus freaks. Look at them again sacrificing so much themselves, losing their, you know, losing their... Uh, their image even to glorify Christ, to speak about Jesus Christ, that's crazy. And sometimes our zeal impels us to do things that we would not normally do. It impels, it impels us to do things that other people would not do for Jesus Christ. And they shake their heads and say that's crazy, but we do it. Why? Because we know that when this life is over, we'll give an account to God. And we know that if there's one thing for which we must live, it must be living to give God the glory in all of the creation around us. Sometimes we're crazy with conviction. There are convictions we hold as believers. 
And by the way, we don't all hold the same convictions. The conviction is something that's a matter of a personal decision between you and God. And your personal conviction before God in some matters might be different from my personal conviction before God. And that's fine. We can live and, and accept each other in our convictions and love each other in our various convictions. That's, that, that's fine. Um, I don't want to give any examples because I don't want to get anybody, I don't want to touch anything too close to anybody here about that. But let's, we ought to be loving and, and, and willing to accommodate each other in our various convi convictions. But we as Christians sometimes have convictions that the world seems crazy. And when we determine to stand by those convictions because we believe that's a matter of our relationship with God and living to be given account to Him someday, there are times that the world will shake their heads and say, you are nuts. Let me give you a historical example. When England first became a Protestant nation, they first left the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, they did, of course, for political reasons. It was King Henry VIII that wanted to be able to divorce and remarry another woman, and the Catholic Church forbid it, and so he joined the Reformation movement, not sincerely, but out of political and selfish reasons. But there were men who were in England at that time who were devoted to the, Reform, to the Reformed doctrines of salvation by grace through faith, and the sola scriptura, the word is our only guide, they were devoted to that. Among them was a man by the name of Thomas Cranmer. And as the, as the, he was a, he was a, a professor, and as the, the nation became Protestant instead of, instead of uh, Catholic, they started the Church of England. They wanted to build on the same structure, and so they wanted someone to be the archbishop. It used to be the Archbishop of Canterbury was kind of the guy that was in charge of all the Catholics in England, but now they want an archbishop for the Anglican Church. So they put Thomas Cranmer in that position. Unfortunately, when Henry VIII died, his uh, son f succeeded him, and he didn't live very long, and he also died. So the next person in line was his daughter, who had been raised in Spain and was Catholic. Her name was Mary, so we call her in history Bloody Mary. She came back to the throne, and she tried to force England to become Catholic again. Many of people had become Anglican, become Church of England, become Reformed in their doctrine. Among them, of course, Thomas Cranmer. And so in order to force the whole nation back into Catholicism, she began to persecute believers in the Reformed doctrines. And so Thomas Cranmer was arrested and put in the Tower of England. He was told that if he did not recant his beliefs, he would be burned at the stake. For a while, he refused to recant. But people kept coming to him and saying, listen, it's, it, it, it's, it's insane for you not to recant. Your life is worth so much more than just being burned at the stake. All you've got to do is just simply, we've got the confession written out for you, just simply have to sign this line. Sign your name here and, and you'll be reinstated and you'll not have to face the stake. After a lot of pressure and in fear of being burned at the stake, finally Thomas Cranmer signed his name at that recantation, or that recantation of his beliefs. He was released, but he could not live with himself because he was truly a believer in Jesus Christ. His faith was in Christ alone for salvation, not in the Catholic Church or its sacraments. And so after a while of just torture within himself, he wrote up and issued his own recantation of his recantation and said, no, I was forced to recant and I did it in a moment of my weakness. And so at this time, I reinstate my position before you all as a believer in the finished work of Jesus Christ for my salvation. Immediately, he was thrown back in the tower. Immediately, he was again given the sentence he would die at the stake. This time, he did not recant his faith. And as he was led to the stake that day, he asked for one indulgence, and that was that they would allow him because his right hand had signed his original recantation of his true faith, they would allow him to put his own hand in the fire before the rest of him was burned. According to the historians, he did that exact act. He stuck his hand in the fire and held it there until literally it was burned to the bone. And then he himself was tied to the stake and the fire was again ignited and he gave his life for what he believed. And the world would say, that's crazy. All you got to do is sign a line. You can hold your own belief in your heart. You just have to pretend to be something else. We as believers sometimes say, no, our convictions dictate that we do this and thus. They don't understand it. They think we're crazy. And it's to God. 
Sometimes we're crazy in our labor. See, they'll say, why are they doing so much for Jesus? Why is it the church so important? And why is God's work so important? And why do they do so much for God? They say, it's so crazy. There's so many other things you could be enjoying in life. So many other things you could be doing. They shake their heads and say, this, you know, I understand church has its place and you can give some time to that. I understand God has his place and give some time to God. What they don't understand is when a believer gets so sold out to God that every moment of every day is consumed with glorifying God. They say, no, that's, that's insane. I'll never understand. And they don't have to understand any of these things. They don't understand why we're happy in tribulation. They don't have to understand why we're zealous. I don't have to understand why we, why we um, have convictions. I don't understand why we labor. We can try to convince them why we do those things, but if they don't understand, the truth is that we will never answer to them. And someday, when we stand before God, the accounting will be made. And I hope that for us, like Thomas Cranmer, there is a greater fear of God than there is a fear of man's punishment in this world. Paul says, whether we be beside ourselves or to God. Why? Because we're trying to live transparently, transparently in the fear of God. And sometimes that makes us seem crazy. Other times, by the way, it makes us seem quite sane. Or whether we be, we be sober, this is the opposite. It is for your cause. And sometimes as we are living out the glory of God, we are quite sober. Why? Because we want to be able to reach you with this same truth. Why is it that we as believers do not engage in, in drunkenness? Why is it that we battle so that we will not be controlled by drugs? Why is it that we take stands so that we will not be intemperate in any of our doings and dealings? It's because we know that other people are impacted by the way we live. Now understand, let me say this, there are believers out there who are drunk and there are believers out there that are on drugs. There are believers out there who are living intemperate lives, but they are not making a difference in the lives of others while they do so. Paul says the reason we control ourselves, one of the reasons, the reason we, because we know the terror of God. We know that someday you'll stand before God. We know that someday we'll stand before God. And so our lives will be conformed to this truth that God be glorified. My friends, the first thing we can take away from the knowledge that someday we will stand before God is the fear. And I mean really the fear of God. As I said at the beginning, I don't have a real fear of fire because I know that as long as I keep it in the stone ring, okay. I know as long as I build my fire inside the fireplace, we'll be all right. I know that if I'm burning a bonfire and I have you know, no combustible area around, no combustible material around, and I have some water there, a hose or something, I'll be okay. I know the rules. I still have a fear of fire that's latent there. It's a fear that understands its tremendous power. But because I'm doing the things that I should, the fear doesn't drive me. It's the same thing with our fear of God. Listen, we will someday give an account, but if we have lived our lives righteously and for the glory of God as Christians, as the Bible says, we will give an account without fear, without shame able to stand before him in an open conscience and saying, Lord, everything that you're seeing today in me is everything that I've seen and I've been seeing all along. I've been showing it. You know, I'm living it purely and as much as I can. Now, his, listen to me. None of us does that perfectly. All of us sin. I do too. You do. We all sin. We all fall short. We all backslide from God at times. But if we will confess those things and make them right with God, those will be forgiven as well and we can stand before him someday prepared for that judgment. And I preach this to you today as my brothers and sisters whom I love dearly so that if it's your time this week and God should take you home or whenever it is that God will take you standing before him, when you stand there before him, you will enter in there ready to meet your God and that you will hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. 